Good evening, welcome to the program produced by the Agency for Public Information, and I'm your host, Kathy Rose. On today's edition, young Vincentians receive scholarships to pursue studies in Taiwan. The Gender Affairs Division within the Ministry of Social Development launches this year's Single Parent Program. And we have a report on a regional meeting which was held here recently to review the draft Community Environment and Natural Resources Framework. The details to these stories will follow the news. Good evening, welcome to Newswatch for Thursday, August 4th, 2016. I am Nelly Skipid, thanks for joining us. The St. Vincent Electricity Services Limited Vinlec continues work to rehabilitate the hydro power station located at South Rivers. The work is part of an ongoing project by Vinlec to upgrade the company's hydro facilities in an effort to improve operational efficiency. A major part of the rehabilitation work involves the replacement of traditional wood stave pipes by glass reinforced plastic, which will run along the route from the power station to the water catchment area in the mountains. Engineering manager Dr. Vaughn Lewis explains. We have done this for various reasons. We, we have to look at the financial aspect, the glass reinforced plastic technology. It's a cheaper technology um, and there are some technical benefits it's um, to use in the glass reinforced plastic. Um, it gives better flow characteristics and uh, reduces the, the, the loss that, that you can have in the pipeline. Um, importantly also we can bury the pipeline and we after the incidents in 2010, 2011 and 2013 we made a decision that we are going to bury as much of the pipeline as we can, new pipeline as much as we can, to harden them and make them more resistant to um, climate change um, events. The work at South Rivers is extensive and includes upgrade of the power station and office buildings. The South Rivers Rehabilitation Project is one of the major capital projects being undertaken by Vinlec this year and is estimated to cost approximately 6.5 million EC dollars. Meanwhile, the company is also completing work on a solar PV project where panels are being installed at the company's facilities at Kane Hall and Lomans Bay. Engineering manager Dr. Vaughn Lewis tells us more. We have installed approximately 570 kilowatts of solar. Um, we have used um, the roof of a large building at Kane Hall, the, the stores building at Kane Hall and a large area on the ground, field area at Lomans Bay. And um, we have installed this facility to help to reduce our, our fuel bill. The Chamber of Industry and Commerce recently held a seminar to discuss the draft Occupational Safety and Health Bill, which is expected to be enacted in St. Vincent and the Grenadines within the coming months. President of the Chamber, Tony Regisford, said the seminar is part of the Chamber's efforts to promote compliance with the bill's legislative requirements. What the Chamber wants to facilitate this morning is that we have a look at what's being proposed. It's a draft bill. We understand the implications. I mentioned the word compliance because I think that this is going to be the main point of discussion. What would it take for us to be compliant to what's being proposed in this bill? The cost factors, serious cost factors in some cases, the training that's required for your staff and management. There are lots of factors that we have to consider. Meanwhile, Labour Commissioner Nerissa Gittins Macmillan called upon business owners and managers to make meaningful contributions to the discussions so that the outcome may be mutually beneficial. I urge, while you're here, to as much as possible air your concerns with the draft bill. I imagine that there are going to be a lot of it because give or take, we know that the bill has a lot of financial implications up front. 
so that somehow we have to come up with a final product that we can all work along with. Three weeks of workshop on early childhood care and education came to a close on Friday, July 29, 2016 at the Girls High School. The Summer Institute was organized by the Ministry of Education with support from the Basic Needs Trust Fund, the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Teachers Union and the Canadian Teachers Federation. Coordinator of the Early Childhood Care and Education Summer Institute, Gwyneth Cambridge, in her opening remarks said she was pleased that the participants completed the entire workshop. I want to say that we don't ever think about it, but early childhood education is really the bridge between our little children and the journey, their educational sojourn. Because after we would have laid the foundation and facilitated the transition, we know that our children are poised at the threshold of, and I would say, embracing education. Project manager of the BNTF, Kenneth Douglas, said the BNTF is very proud of their involvement in skills training as they ensure that the human resource in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is being developed. What you would have assimilated over the last six weeks, three weeks this year and three weeks last year, is something you will take to your grave. It's something that you can use to extend to your own children and to your grandchildren. It's learning for life. And that's why we are so proud and excited at BNTF to make sure that we, are getting, we get involved in skills training. This is where we end News Watch for this evening. I am Nelly Skipid. The API presentation continues. Have a good evening. Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, are you interested in creating the next big app? Or maybe you'd like to know how you can protect information systems from theft or damage to the hardware, software, or misdirection of the services they provide. While the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Community College, in collaboration with the NTRC, is giving you the opportunity to develop or enhance your skills with an associate degree program in cybersecurity and an associate degree program in software development. Sign up for these cutting-edge programs and get one step closer to fulfilling your dreams. For more information, contact or visit the SVG Community College Glen Campus. Register now. Don't be late. Welcome back. The Taiwan Scholarships Program, namely the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, MOFA, and the Taiwan International Cooperation Development, Taiwan ICDF Scholarships, were launched in 2004. The aim of the program is to encourage outstanding foreign students to pursue academic degrees in Taiwan and to deepen their understanding of Taiwan's academic environment. This, in turn, fosters cultural exchanges and builds friendships. In St. Vincent and the Grenadines, our friendship with Taiwan continues to grow as its government is doing its part to enhance national development by offering scholarships to Vincentians. The local embassy of the ROC on Taiwan hosted a presentation ceremony for the 2016 Taiwan Scholarship recipients on Tuesday at the SVG Community College. Here is more in this report. This year, 16 Vincentians will soon leave these shores to commence tertiary education in various universities in the Republic of China on Taiwan. To this end, the presentation ceremony of the 2016 Taiwan Scholarships Program convened at the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Community College on Tuesday, August 2nd. Ambassador of the Republic of China on Taiwan to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, His Excellency Ambassador Ba Shang extended congratulations on behalf of the government and people of the Republic of China on Taiwan to all the 2016 scholarship recipients and to Ms. Latoya Williams. Williams, according to Ambassador Gur, will be the first Vincentian to teach English in Taiwan under the Ministry of Education Foreign English Teachers Program. 
Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here with you at the presentation ceremony for the 2016 Taiwan Scholarships Program. I'm pleased to announce that uh, 17 positions are awarded with Taiwan scholarships offered by both the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Republic of China, Taiwan, and Taiwan ICDF this year. The number of the recipients is ac exactly the same as the one last year. However, one recipient decided to decline the offer at the very last moment. Uh, so now we are going to send 16 students to Taiwan this year. Uh, actually, I just came back from, from Taipei, and uh, when I was in Taipei for home consultations, I also got my uh, ambassadors from Nicaragua and uh, Haiti. They were shocked to know that uh, uh, you got the 17 uh, scholarships for instance. Uh, they cried unfair. Nicaragua said that they got the 60, 6 million people, but they got only 10 scholarships. Haiti got only 12, and their population is uh, 10 million. Uh, actually, uh, I think you can remember uh, early this year when I had these uh, uh, presentations uh, at different uh, occasions, I, I said that uh, you have to fight very hard for the, for the uh, scholarships because you compete with, uh, with the students from other countries. And this proves that you are doing a very good job in, uh, in, in, the, in, this, in this way. Uh, so uh, on behalf of the government of Republic of China, I want to uh, convey my warmest congratulations to each and every one of the recipients this year. Since the inception of the Taiwan Scholarships Program in 2004, at the very initiative of Prime Minister Ralph Gonsalves, over the last 11 years, more than 110 physicians have benefited from these two scholarships. However, education has never been cheap. For these two scholarships, uh, I've done a little research. It costs about uh, 17,500 US dollars for each recipient every physical year. That means for a four-year college program, my government will invest on each of the recipients 70,000 US dollars. That is an equivalent of 189,000 EC dollars. Uh, expenses on the uh, Chinese, uh, Mandarin Chinese program and the airfare actually are on top of that. As for each Taiwanese college student, the figure is roughly uh, 20,000 US dollars. Medicine programs, of course, cost higher, and the humanities are less so. But that means the students in Taiwan will have to find their resources to pay for their own tuition and the living expenses, and they don't have to do that. The reason for my country to launch such a program for the students of our diplomatic allies is that we believe nurturing young talents to be well equipped with crucial skills and knowledge will benefit the development of the countries those students come from. I'm proud to share with you that in St. Vincent Grenadines, the scholarships we have offered have bear fruitful results. We got the many shining examples are the members of the Taiwan Alumni, uh, Scholar Alumni Association. This year, the disciplines the students are going to pursue range from computer science, medicine, trade, environment, engineering, international relations, etc., etc. In his remarks, Minister of Education, Honorable St. Clair Jimmy Prince, extended gratitude to the government of the Republic of China on Taiwan for making a big contribution to the education revolution in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I'm very happy to be at this uh, particular ceremony. I know what it is doing for the careers and lives of our young people here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The Taiwanese are making a very big injection in our education revolution, the tertiary component of it. Of course, you know the Ministry of Education and the government uh, doing a lot for education, uh, have been doing a lot in, the, in this period. We've been looking at um, pre-primary education, primary education, secondary education, tertiary education. We also have an emphasis on the TVET and also on special education and adult and continuing education. This particular component, the tertiary education, we've been doing a lot in this regard. Of course, you've seen the upgrade of this particular facility here at the college. 
and you have seen government um, increasing bursaries for people studying um, at the tertiary level. So we're very grateful that the Taiwanese is doing, making this great injection into this particular process of the education revolution. And we hope that you're just as grateful as we are in the Ministry of Education, and that you become focused, uh, you do what you have to do in Taiwan, and then you return to be part of the process of development here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I thank you very much for accepting. I thank the Taiwanese once again for the help. I know you have done a lot in terms of the one-off uh, scholarships for primary schools and at this uh, institution also. Thank you very much and enjoy Taiwan. Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Ralph Gonsalves reiterated his commitment to education in St. Vincent and the Grenadines as the government aims to have, on average, one university graduate per household. This year would make 126 students would have gone to, well, 110 have been already to Taiwan, and now 16 this year. As His Excellency pointed out, the value to you of the scholarship per year, the cost, is roughly, for the five years, in EC dollars, it's about $200,000. <clears throat> which means thus far they have contributed over two million EC dollars in, well, sorry, over 20 million, 20 million EC dollars in scholarships, which is a significant amount of money. The we started the program, I'd asked the ambassador at the time who was here if we could start a program given the nature of our relationships. And uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Taiwan, the government of Taiwan agreed and we started with small numbers and then we have grown to where we are today. <clears throat> And what we seek to do is to provide the embassy with a list of priorities and they will try to stay within the ambit of those priorities. Occasionally, depending on the circumstances, we may go a little outside of the priorities, but basically we stay within the priorities which we need for our manpower training, and for our socioeconomic development. For instance, I'm, I'm not going to advocate we send in somebody to Taiwan to study sociology. Not that sociology is not a subject worthy of study, or indeed psychology or anthropology, important subjects in their own right. So we, 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 we look at our overall manpower needs and we make certain suggestions certain recommendations in the light of our priority areas. And I know that I've been told that about 400 students made inquiries and 80 students applied. So you're the 16 of the 80. So that's, um, there's, a, there's a good screening process which, which goes on. And they, I know the Taiwanese take their their role very seriously at the embassy and in the, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Taiwan as to the persons who are selected. We have a number of good candidates <coughs> who have not made it this year and I simply tell them when they come to me with regret, I said, well, apply again next year. You know, and um, people, who, students who have gotten into schools in Taipei, in Taiwan, um, but who didn't make the grade in being in the 16 selected. And there are objective criteria used for the selection of the students. So you would have been the best students who would have applied. 
and I want to congratulate you very much. The broad public policy goal of the government is to have one university graduate on an average to every household by 2030. And we are on target. We're on target for it. Because we have about roughly 36,000 households in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Of course, we don't have 36,000. We are not approaching 36,000 university graduates who reside in St. Vincent and the Grenadines because we have a lot of our university graduates who are working in other parts of the Caribbean and other parts of the world. But the aim is to have, on an average, one university graduate per household. Curator of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Botanical Garden and former Taiwan scholar, Mr. Gordon Shallow, offered congratulatory remarks to the awardees and words of encouragement. To the scholars, I say congratulations on successfully obtaining this firm financial foundation for securing higher education, the key to your future and success. As your journey now begins, I wish you all success and God's richest blessings as a lifetime of wonderful experiences awaits you in a place called Taiwan, halfway around the world, literally. Just a, few year, just a few years ago, travel to Taiwan or the Oriental Far East was not something that many Vincentians may have thought commonplace as a choice destination for study. Though our two countries have enjoyed cordial, bilateral, and diplomatic relations for quite a while, with many high-level government official visits by either side. The Prime Minister alluded to that in his um, deliberations. Recipient of the Move for Taiwan Scholarship, Ms. Alicia Cox, concluded the scholarship presentation ceremony with the vote of thanks. Therefore, on behalf of the 2016 Taiwan Scholarship recipients, I extend a very hearty thank you to all those who have contributed to our current success in one way or the other. As we all know, an ignited mind is the most powerful weapon on the earth. Thus, education is the most profitable investment for the near future. As such, we the recipients would like to thank God for his never-ending grace, mercy, and the provision. For without him, we would have nothing. Our hope is that he will continue to bless us and to keep us as we prepare ourselves to work diligently. I would like to thank Ambassador Ge and the Republic of China, Taiwan, and its people for the unwavering support given to Vincentian students as we seek higher education. Thanks to your generous support, many amongst myself are the first in our families to attend university, and others are given the opportunity to advance further in their studies. For this, we are all sincerely honored. I also thank the Honorable Prime Minister and the Government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines for the effort, hard work, and consideration placed on each and every Vincentian child from the education revolution to the advancement of higher education. Reporting for the Agency for Public Information, I am Keisha Woodley. You're viewing a presentation by the Agency for Public Information. We'll be right back after the break. Natural history includes the long-tailed white tropic birds that migrate to our skies and rock faces, the North Atlantic humpback whale that comes to our warm waters to give birth to and nurse their young, the critically endangered hawksbill turtle and the St. Vincent parrot. These are all creatures that the National Trust seeks to protect for future generations. For more than 40 years, the National Trust has worked to save St. Vincent and the Grenadines' most beloved places, landscapes, and seascapes, where great moments of history took place. We work together with communities to value and protect important pieces of our cultural community, national history, and environment, 
such as the series of decorated Salvador pots found in Clear Valley, signifying that St. Vincent's civilization is almost 2,000 years old. We do this all because the next generation needs to know our stories, as they will only inherit the places and species we choose to save today. We urge you to plant a tree under whose shade you never plan to sit. Join the National Trust today. On Tuesday, the Ministry of National Mobilization held an orientation ceremony for 55 young people who will participate in the single parent program for this year. The group represents the second cohort of the program, selected from over 25 communities around the country to gain valuable skills and experiences through collaborative efforts orchestrated by the Division of Gender Affairs within the Ministry. Sherice John has this report. Moving from a state of dependence to independence is the theme representing a new initiative spearheaded by the Division of Gender Affairs within the Ministry of National Mobilization. The program, which targets single parents, is geared towards capacity building and economic enabling. Through various mechanisms such as job placement and skills training, participants are expected to become more equipped to provide for themselves and their families. In welcome remarks, coordinator of the Gender Affairs Division, Polly Oliver, noted that this single parent program falls well in line with the objectives set out in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals of 2015. This program is solely hinged on government's support for vulnerable families in reducing childcare burdens of single parents under the age of 30. I would like to point out that enhancing capacity building for women has never been more timely with the crucial announcement of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. Goal number five states, to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls is central to the achievement of full human potential and of sustainable development. Therefore, this reminds us that gender equality is more than just a comforting perception but it will have a working body once it is embedded in every public and private action that we take. Dealing with gender equality and women's rights through education has become a top mission of the Gender Affairs Division. The Gender Affairs Division has had the pleasure of developing and implementing our own program, our own training programs to spread awareness and knowledge of gender issues. Nevertheless, women are still a marginalized, vulnerable group, and they are vulnerable to political and socioeconomic pressures. So we sincerely hope that our mission to be of a help to any institution and to people who are committed in the area of gender equality education would continue to have great impact as we are proud of our achievements. We hope to inspire meaningful ideas from your work and performance on this program. I hope that the knowledge shared and generated from this training program will guide you in your pursuit to ensuring a better life for you and your children. I wish you a stimulating training exercise and a pleasant day. Once again, welcome to all. Meanwhile, Program Officer at the Gender Affairs Division, Corinne Duncan, gave an overview of the Single Parent Program. Why we thought within gender that this program was important is uh, it is not always easy to raise a child. And worse, under poor circumstances. Hence why we see the importance of this program. We are taking our time with the program so that's why we start so we start with small numbers and then as we go we'll be able to increase the numbers the program is to move single parents from a state of being dependent to becoming independent and while it is that the room is a little biased with only single mothers the program is also open to single fathers as well 
While on the program, you would be given support from the Ministry of National Mobilization in several forms. One, we do job placement through the YES program. Last year, we were able to place 10 ladies. This year, we were able to get a permanent placement for one and different ministries ask for extension for three. Skills development, we have uh, persons from different areas. Um, we, we stretch as far as we go, we use YWCA. So there are some girls who might be interested in sewing. We get persons who are into hair. We get persons who are into cake decorating. What, what we try to do, we may not be able to meet everybody's specific need, but what we try to do is we try to structure the program to meet your need. So, we're able, so you're able to be comfortable with what we're providing you. We're not spoon feeding anything to you. We anticipate that you, this is something you want. You want to move from a state of being independent. You want to be independent. You want to be able to provide for your children comfortably. And to be able to do that, you have to want it. And with what you want, we try to facilitate the structure for you to help yourself. We're not doing anything for you, All right? Um, we also open avenues through second chance academic achievements through ACE, Adult Continuing Education. So persons who might be interested in, to do, in doing subjects, we open that avenue for you. Also, this year it is new for us. We have a new program, ANU. Um, with ANU, and I think several of you would have done the application form. It's where you would go to one of the technical institutes for a full year, and at the end of that, you would be presented with a certificate once you've done the required work. Agricultural production. What we hope to do is persons who have space in their backyards or surrounding area and you want to start planting, I mean, you could provide for your family food. You could provide food for your family through that means. We, again, we provide the structure for that. In his featured address, Minister of National Mobilization, the Honorable Frederick Stevenson, outlined the goals and responsibilities of his ministry, which he states are geared towards consistently and systematically improving the conditions of the most vulnerable within our society. As we know, um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines is a multi-island state with 30.2% of the poor and vulnerable which we try to target from time to time as part of the social protection network. And so therefore the Ministry of National Mobilization is the responsible Ministry for Social Development from time to time have to consistently and systematically revolutionize rehabilitate and empower interventions to provide a social safety nets and upward mobility for the vulnerable persons within our societies. In an effort towards reducing poverty in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Ministry of National Mobilization, the government must identify the multidimensional issues that are one, income and socially connected to poverty and other ailments that affect families throughout the country. We cannot fool ourselves there. There are persons in St. Vincent and the Grenadines who are in need and persons who are poor and who from time to time would require the help and the assistance of the government and other cooperate entities and institutions. As a result of the work that we have done within the ministry, we have done some reforms of our services and operations and has deployed the following to improve its capacity. One, 
a monitoring and evaluation framework to assess periodically and evaluate the impact rates of its programs, to a management information system to assist in the efficiency and effectiveness of services, three, a program of and psychosocial assessment toolkit to assist in the assessment of quality of care and rate of transition in standard of living of clientele. Four, a business reengineering of its programs and operatives, ensuring that the right strategies, tactics, and operations are deployed across the main program areas within the ministry. With these tools, the ministry is quite poised to implement and monitor the services it offers. If human capital development initiatives, are, as well as social protection and integration of the poor and vulnerable policies are designed and or re-engineered, then a total state dependency can transition into partial and extensive social independence of existing beneficiaries. In addition, the ministry has streamlined its programming to six divisions as follows. One, policy development and administration. Two, social protection. Three, child development. Four, gender development. Five, youth development. Six, family and community development. Through the social protection program, attempts would be made towards improving the quality, quantity, and access of social assistance and labor market interventions to the incident poor, vulnerable, and marginalized populations in the society. That is basically why we're here today. Because the ministry have seen your need, and we have put in place a program to assist you. This morning's session is geared towards single parents who are at a greater disadvantage in meeting the average generic financial, social, and physical needs of the home. And as a result, this apparent social norm is one of the main factors contributing to the increase in many social ills in society, especially for poor and vulnerable households. And we know that, as I said before. We know that as a fact. Um, I'm not... I'm trying to use, I'm not giving a speech this morning. I'm, I'm trying to, to have a conversation with you, the, the participants. Because not, not all of the times um, persons are receptive to the minister standing up and talking. Sometimes they say talking down to them. But we're having a conversation this morning, a practical conversation, because... We are practical individuals who want to see the best for everybody and to, to move you, as your team says, moving from a state of dependence to independence. Reporting for the Agency for Public Information, I'm Sharish John. Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, are you interested in creating the next big app? Or maybe you'd like to know how you can protect information systems from theft or damage to the hardware, software, or misdirection of the services they provide. While the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Community College, in collaboration with the NTRC, is giving you the opportunity to develop or enhance your skills with an associate degree program in cybersecurity and an associate degree program in software development. Sign up for these cutting-edge programs and get one step closer to fulfill filling your dreams. For more information, contact or visit the SVG Community College Glen Campus. Register now. Don't be late. A regional meeting to review the draft Community Environment and Natural Resources Framework concluded here last week at the Sunset Shores Hotel. The legislative context of the policy framework, along with public education, were some of the issues on the agenda at the three-day meeting. Here is more in the following report. A three-day regional meeting on the management of the environment and natural resources was held on Monday, July 25th to Wednesday, July 27th and saw various regional delegates reviewing the draft community environment and natural resource policy framework and first action program. 
Anya Thomas is the CARICOM Secretariat Representative for the Sustainable Development Division. Thomas gave a background of the program. In 2008, the Ministers of Environment mandated the Secretariat to develop a community environment policy, um, recognizing that there was a need to bring the region together around environmental management and um, sustainable use manage and management of the region's natural resources, because obviously, um, as small island developing states, we are all dependent on our natural resources for trade and, and growth and competitiveness, etc. So after um, the time that we needed to mobilize the resources and develop the draft, we're here over, we've been here over the last three days to um, discuss the preliminary draft that's now available, um, determine sort of the gaps. Uh, what member states might be interested in proceeding on, what they would prefer to leave for a later date, um, and to get some sort of preliminary uh, approval, I would say, um, of the document before it goes for formal endorsement by the ministers, which we anticipate should be in early November. Nyasha Hamilton is an environmental educator in the Sustainable Development Ministry. What we're trying to do is to come up with a common environmental policy framework. So what is it is that once that framework is, has, and the work plan has been developed, countries will take that and then have to break it down on a national level to implement and then meet their own goals and targets because once that imp that policy framework is adopted by quoted in October and quoted is Council of Trade and Environment it's um, one of the, the CARICOM bodies once that adop is adopted it becomes legally binding on, on member states so they're bound and compelled to, to implement whatever is in that document so I think that is part of the reason why we've had such um, such discussion because everybody wants to make sure that what ends up in the document is that things that can actually be implemented at a national level and that can actually be implemented in all the countries so because you have such a wide variance of, of I don't want to say development but countries are at different levels of implementing certain things where all the Caribbean countries are most of them are signatory to a lot of multilateral environmental agreements so um, so and we're at different stages of implementing those some of us have have enshrined them in laws other in our national laws others of us have not been and even though they're not enshrined in our national laws for instance St. Vincent and the Grenadines hasn't gone very far towards enshrining them in our national laws but we're still expected and obligated to fulfill the obligations under that and then there's not just the conventions, there are also the sustainable development goals. So that's that 2030 agenda. Various topics were up for discussion at the regional meeting, some of which included proper management of land resources and blue growth strategies. The most popular ones so far have been land resources or what we call terrestrial resources. Um, we have been, there's been a great deal of interest around um, ocean resources because we recognize that the oceans um, have not been uh, developed in a way that could um, accrue significant uh, benefits to member states. So they're talking about what we call blue growth strategies. Um, we also, there's also um, a great deal of interest in, in building capacity at the natural, at the national level for things like natural capital accounting. How do we value our natural resources and take, take cognizance of them in the budgeting processes? That also helps with um, how we make development decisions at the national level. And of course, the important issue of trying to standardize certain sorts of procedures and practices with regard to development decision making at the national level. Meanwhile, at the opening ceremony, Minister of Economic Planning and Sustainable Development, the Honorable Camilo Gonzalez, explained the vision of the environmental program and the importance of it to developing states. The draft policy framework begins with a vision that charges CARICOM members, and I quote, to sustainably manage the community's environment and natural cultural resources, including creating and improving conditions necessary for the conservation of nature and maintaining the ecological balance to capitalize on the benefits that will accrue from their optimal utilization, thereby contributing 
to the balanced economic, environmental, and social development of the Caribbean as a, whole, as a community as a whole and its member states. That's a mouthful. But it is a laudable vision, one that will hardly elicit a dissenting voice. Assistant Secretary General for Human and Social Development, CARICOM, Dr. Douglas Slater, stressed the need for addressing environmental issues in tackling economic growth and development. As we are all heavily dependent on our natural resource base for trade and economic growth and development, it is understood that resolution of environmental issues is central to the effective functioning of the CSME. CARICOM member states have for the most part pursued individual environmental management policies and programs with varying levels of progress. Increased investments, opportunities and economic growth will be unsustainable unless environmental policy considerations are taken into account particularly as an incentive to greater long-term efficiency and competitiveness, and with particular reference to the wider international marketplace. At the conclusion of the meeting, the issue of sustainability took prominence as regional representatives move forward with this initiative. Sustainability, because you know, a lot of our projects are externally funded. So that is always a big thing we have to figure out. When, we're, when implementation from grant funds is finished, how do we keep that? And I mean, it's an ongoing process. A lot of that is we have to do some institutional strengthening. It means rejigging some of our legislation. It means training, increasing your, your technical capacity in your ministries. It means some persons have to take on more responsibilities or maybe shift focus and... For imp and implementation, and that's why I said we've had quite a lot of discussion. Well, sustainability is going to be an underlying factor in how, obviously, how we move forward. Um, because we are small island developing states and that are heavily dependent on, on natural resources. So, so, and of course, for any policy or action plan that we develop, the necessary resources are going to be mobilized. So that is going to have to be mobilized. So that is one of the things that we're actually discussing as a key part of the policy and the action program. Where is the money coming from? How are we going to, 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 to mobilize the necessary resources for all of the capacity work that has to be done at, at the national level across the uh, 15 member states of CARICOM? So yes, sustainability is going to be, has to be an integral part of any discussion the region has on these things. With any program, there must be challenges. The major one predicted so far is that of finance. I think the biggest challenge really is to get 15 different member states to agree on how certain things could be done. Because you have um, 15 different national circumstances, you have uh, 15 different um, levels of development, and as with any other process, trying to get everybody to one place takes time. So, so I think that is not necessarily going to be the biggest challenge, but it is something that we have to be cognizant. I think the, the, the biggest challenge really for us as a region is the financing. Because um, as you know, we've been going through an economic recession still. We still are going through an economic recession and finding, creating the fiscal space at the national level to invest in certain types of activities is going to be a challenge. So that, I think that financing one is going to be the biggest hurdle that we have to overcome. Public awareness is a critical step in targeting goals. On the local front, a more modern approach will be taken. Public awareness and is, is, has been not a big part, but I mean, it has to be an integral part of anything that you're doing. Because you want to not just be doing things at a policy level or even at a ministerial level. This, these sorts of things for success need buy-in from not just the public sector, but also the private sector and, and the general public. So you'd have to do consultations, whether it's with the private sector, you'd have to do community consultations. And we'll probably have to stray away from our usual of going to communities in the middle of the day when a lot of the people that you want to target aren't at home. So I mean, 
kind of probably just changing the way and using the available media that TV, radio, social media, and I guess just updating the way we do things. After this stage, we member states have to do their own national consultations. Um, this meeting has really been for the technical officials to take a very critical look at the documents. But obviously they have to go back and talk to their own stakeholders at the national level. So um, there's going to be a period of time for national stakeholder discussion and consultation, and then um, further review of the document, and then it is supposed to be submitted to the ministers of environment in October of this year for uh, endorsement or further de uh, decision making as the as the um, minister see fit. After that, it then goes. It has to go up the decision making chain in 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 CARICOM. So we anticipate um, it, it will eventually reach the heads of government. Um, but in terms of further work after that document is approved, we will have to then de develop an implementation plan. So we take each of the priority action areas and break it down into step-by-step -step, um, actions at the national and regional level. There's going to be that exercise that is likely to be completed by March of next year, which is the implementation plan, a resource mobilization strategy costings, and then we roll to implementation. What this particular activity is going to do is look at how we uh, use, manage, and conserve, sustainably utilize, uh, manage, and conserve our resources. So what obviously is going to happen is that we, we begin to become more competitive. That is the aim of, 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 of looking at a regional policy and action program. How do we address our competitiveness um, also with the use and management of our, our natural resources? So obviously if we are able to put certain types of solutions in place, it means that our, our, our industries, and not just tourism, agriculture, um, goods and services, all the industries that have some kind of impact in the environment, we, we, we hopefully can begin to operate in a more efficient manner. So it is, we're trying to fix the underlying issues with the hope that the spin-off benefits will lead eventually to improve competitiveness, improved efficiencies, and so on. I'm very pleased that the, 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 the level of, of cooperation and, and interest in the processes um, that we've had from the member states, they are extremely keen on, 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 on seeing this happen because it's been a long time coming and there's a great deal of enthusiasm to work together and that is encouraging, very, very encouraging. Yeah, thank you, thank you. The draft CARICOM Environment and Natural Resources Policy Framework and First Environment Action Program, which commences this year, is expected to run for five years. Reporting for the API, I am Sheridan Lewis. As they say, all good things must come to an end. And here is where we say goodbye. Remember to join us every Tuesday and Thursday beginning at 8 in the evening and on Saturdays at 5 or you can go to our Facebook page, the Agency for Public Information, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Good night, have a wonderful weekend and why not visit the public library sometime and get hooked up with a good book. I am Kathy Rose.